way to start a sermon. I'm so thankful for those brothers. I'm thankful for the work that they're doing in this church. Um, I'm thankful for God and his provision over us. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and flip open to 1 Peter chapter 3, and we're going to now get jump into the text of God's word for the time of the sermon. And as we do so, I think it's a very appropriate Sunday to get to this text, just as last week is kind of providential that the text we were in landed on Mother's Day. I think it's appropriate that this text falls right after we install um, two men of God into leadership in our church. And the title of this morning's sermon is A Godly Husband. And as you flip over 1 Peter chapter 3, I just want you to ask yourselves and to think about our society at large and ask where are all the godly men at? Where are all the godly men at? In many ways, our society has many problems right now. Think of in our country alone, over a million babies are murdered each year, and that's what happens in formal clinics, not to mention all kinds of other abortions that happen through various forms of birth control that we will never know. Our kids are being exposed to all kinds of truly vile things, whether it's through um, their devices or in culture or in the classroom and all kinds of places. Kids can get exposed to all kinds of different things. Immorality is accessible and easy and celebrated in our society around us. Divorce rates are extremely high, and many of us know because many of us grew up in broken homes where our parents were divorced or never married. And for the first time ever, we're actually seeing in society that there's actually a declining birth rate in our country, meaning we're having less children than there are of us. Before, you know, that classic couple would have like 2.5 children or whatever, and you'd always kind of laugh because you're like, where'd the half child go, right? Well, as of the most recent studies, it's 1.6. And so literally you think of the most initial command that we are given as a human race to be fruitful and multiply, and we are not doing that. We are actually declining. Fatherlessness particularly is rampant in our country with 18.3 million children that grow up in a fatherless home. Wrap your head around that number, 18.3 million. That's one in four children does not have a father in the home. And that's not even talking about necessarily even just biological father. That's like with no stepdad, no adoptive father, no anything. They have no father present in the home at all. One in four children in this country. And of kids that come from fatherless homes, 63% of youth suicides are from those fatherless homes. 90% of all homeless and runaway children are from fatherless homes. Wrap your head around that. That's 32 times the average. 85% of all children who show behavior disorders come from fatherless homes. And 71% of all high school dropouts come from fatherless homes. I say all that to say that we have a problem with men stepping up and doing what they're supposed to be doing in this country. And a lot of the things we look around and see, it's because men are not doing what God has called them to do. And all the while, while these men seem absent in places where they're desperately needed, they're catching up on all their Netflix originals, right? They're binge watching shows, they're consumed with their phones, they're given over to their hobbies, they're spending every night at the bar, whatever it is, they're just occupied with things other than what God has called them to do. Many are being mastered by secret sins. And men, God has called us to something higher. He's given us a noble calling. I think one of the reasons we're in the place we are in this country is because men have not been given a good mission that derives from the word of God. We're just left to try to figure it out as we go rather than be given the mission that God has called us to this morning. And as we're going to see, hopefully, as we study God's word, that God has given us a great mission. And as men, we need to step up to that mantle and take responsibility for being godly husbands, godly leaders in our homes, and live the way that God has called us to live from his word. 
This sermon is really a part two in many ways. Last week, we looked at a godly wife in verses one through six, and this whole section is flowing from Peter, where back in chapter two, verse 13, he says, be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution. And now he's going through various human institutions and giving instructions on how the Christians ought to live in those. And this is part two as we look at the family and particularly husbands. So I'm going to read beginning in the text we were in last week, starting in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 1, and go through verse 7. Verse 7 is actually the only verse that we will be studying this morning. But to get the full context, let's begin at verse 1. Listen to the word of God. Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives when they see your respectful and pure conduct. Do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair, the putting on of gold jewelry, or the clothing you wear, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. For this is how holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands. As Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and you are her children if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. And verse seven, likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Let's go before God in prayer. Oh, dear Heavenly Father, I pray for every man in this room who is blessed enough to be married, Lord, would you not hinder our prayers? What you have to say to us this morning, may we be quick to listen and slow to speak. Would we come under your word? Would we be humble before you this morning, God? Where there are sins in our lives, would we be quick to run to your throne of grace and forgiveness? Will we not be so proud to think that we have this all figured out? So God, I pray that you would be humbling us this morning, helping us to seek to conform ourselves to your word, helping us to pursue you in holiness and righteousness based on all that you've done for us. And God, I pray that your gospel would be put on full display this morning, that we would see that our hope can never be in our performance but can only be in Christ and Christ alone and the work of the cross and the cross alone, that we are sinners saved by a merciful, wonderful Savior. And as men, would that be foundational to our identity? Would we be men that live in light of what Christ has done? God, would you instruct us from your word? Would you help me to speak clearly and not to go beyond what your word says? Would you allow all of us to have ears to hear what you would have to say? It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. So as we are going through this, there will certainly be some repetition from last week. The main points of this sermon are a godly husband is, a godly husband is, a godly husband is, just like last week is, a godly wife is. And just like last week, I want to open by just stating that as we're looking at 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7, which is addressing husbands, that this sermon is not just for husbands. Now to start, it is for married men in here. And if you have a wife, I encourage you to heed what the Word of God is telling you this morning to seek to grow in that calling that God has called you to. But this is also for single men in here, whether you will one day be married or maybe um, you're a widower, and this is helpful ways that you disciple younger men in the church. So I encourage every man of God to be listening to these things. And even if you're never married as a man, similar to what we talked about with women, much of this is just character traits that you live out as you follow Christ. Now, it particularly plays out in a unique way if you're married, but all of these character traits every man of God should have. For the women in here as well, I encourage you as you listen to these things, many of you are mothers with sons. These are the type of things you want to be raising your sons to grow up to do. You want to be helping instill this into them. Women, if you're not married, these are the type of things you need to look for in a future spouse. And if you are married, I think it's helpful in looking at this to know 
what you're called to and what your husband's called to. No single person in the marriage has to bear the responsibility for everything. God has given us unique tasks, and it's helpful to know what is your responsibility, but also what your husband's responsibility is, and to let him take those things that are his, and you take the things that are yours. One of the problems in this world where we try to ignore gender distinctions is we all place every burden on ourselves. Whereas in God's design, we, we get to delegate the labor, so to speak. It's a wonderful blessing that ought to free us up that we don't have to do everything in marriage. We do our part and our spouse does their part. So women, I encourage you to be liberated in some sense that God didn't place all these things on you. Some of these things he placed on the men in your life. Lastly, I just want to say that I'm preaching to myself this morning. <laughs> this was one of those sermons that as you're preparing, you're like, man, I needed to hear this and I need to grow in this. I do not have this all figured out and none of you do either. Because guess what? As men, our standard in marriage and how we lead our wives is Christ. So unless you are perfectly like Christ this morning, you have not yet obtained the standard. So my encouragement, and I'm preaching to myself here and to all the other husbands in the room, let us take a step forward. None of us have arrived, but let us pursue Christ and the things he would have us to do this morning. The last point I'll make before we jump into the text is a lot of the points I'm drawing from this sermon are more implicit than explicit. In other words, as we just look at verse 7, there's a lot of things that make sense when you understand what's implicit behind them, but if you ignore those things, this text doesn't make as much sense. So as we go through this, you might be looking down and go, wait, where does it say that? And just know, I'm trying to draw some things out. They're implicit in the text as well as the things that are explicit in the text. So traits of a godly husband. Let's jump right into it. The first point of this sermon of a godly husband. What does a godly husband look like? A godly husband is redeemed. A godly husband is redeemed. If you're a good note taker or pay attention, you're like, that was your first point last week, but with wives. And yes, because you can't be godly without being redeemed by Christ. And we see implications of that even in the text that we're in. Do you notice at the end of verse 7, when it's talking about the wife being the weaker vessel, it says, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life. Since they are co-heirs of the grace of life, what's the implication? What's he getting at in there? That you're both united to Christ. And that heirs, what is an heir? An heir is usually what? A family member, someone who's going to receive the inheritance, right? Or receive the business or receive the estate, right? It's an heir. Well, we are heirs of the blessings of Christ if we have trusted and put our faith in Christ and Christ alone. Ephesians 1 talks about how we're giving every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Well, if you're going to be a godly husband, you need to be an heir of that grace of life. And you do that by placing your faith in Christ, in Christ alone. It's similar to what we looked at last week. The gospel was accomplished by Jesus being the one who would redeem his bride. But we need to trust in that redeemer ourselves as men. Now, one of the barriers that I've found for men accepting the gospel, and one of the barriers I've found that many men don't want to embrace the gospel is because the gospel implies that you can't do any of the work yourself. The gospel, in order to be saved, you need to trust in the finished work of Christ. But as men, we have a natural and godly instinct to want to work and to provide, right? Right? And that can be a hang-up for us spiritually because we're like, but I want to earn this thing. I want to accomplish it myself. But man, if you're going to be a godly husband when it comes to spiritual things, you got to get over that and humble yourself and say, no, I need the Lord's help. I can't earn this on my own. I can't do it on my own. I need to trust in the finished work of Christ and Christ alone. We got to get over our pride in that. Now, that instinct within us to work is good. We're going to get to that. 
But when it comes to salvation, we have to understand that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The standard is perfection, and we can't meet that in our sin. And thus, we need to trust in the finished work of Christ, in his perfection, his substitutionary death, in his rising from the grave three days later. Not a result of works, lest no man should boast. Men, we love to boast in our work, but at the cross, we cannot do that. If we are to be a godly husband, we must be redeemed by Christ and Christ alone. Have you done that this morning? The second point related to this is that a godly husband is a shepherd. A godly husband is a shepherd. Now, you have to be redeemed in order to be a shepherd. But what a shepherd is, is very similar to what a pastor is. And often we use those terms interchangeably. You see, pastor and pasture sound a lot alike. And a shepherd is one that cares for that. And you see, one that's fascinating, as we just installed an elder, if you're merely listening, one of the qualifications for that is that you have to manage your own household well. And the idea is that if you can't pastor your own family, how are you going to pastor the church at large? And there's a sense in which every man is a pastor of his home. Now, that's not the same as holding a formal office in the church, but every husband is the spiritual leader of his home. He is a shepherd of his home. We see that originated in the Garden of Eden as Adam gave the command not to eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Well, Eve hadn't even been created yet. God gave that command to Adam, and then as Eve was created, it was assumed that Adam was going to teach the word of God to his spouse. And thus, as they fell into sin, God first asked Adam where he was, which we found out he was with her the whole time, right? But he did not instruct her in the word of God as he was supposed to do. He was supposed to be her shepherd. He was supposed to crush the head of the serpent. Instead, that's what Christ would ultimately accomplish. But you see, Adam was given in the garden to be a shepherd for his wife, Eve, and he did not follow that. And we see beautiful pictures of this in different ways, though, in the Bible, as men were trying to lead their households in the way of the Lord. Job is a great picture of this. We often remember Job for his sufferings and the various things he went through. But he's a great example of what a shepherd for his family ought to look like. He's shown at the beginning of the book as offering sacrifices on behalf of his family. He is taking spiritual oversight of his family. And that's one of the reasons why he was considered a noble man of God. Joshua as well. Many of you probably have this plaque on your wall somewhere, right? But he's a great example of a shepherd of his family as he proclaims, as for me and my household, we will serve, or that can be translated, worship the Lord, right? He led his family in worship. And in other words, the whole world might go crazy, but as for me and my household, we are going to worship the Lord. He took ownership of the spiritual oversight of his household. And then we see that as well with pastors in the church. And one of the great proofs text of this is Ephesians 5, verse 25 through 28. As the Apostle Paul is giving instructions to husbands, notice one of the things he tells them to do. He says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her. Notice our, our job is to help sanctify our wife, having cleansed her by the washing of the water with the word washing her in the word of God so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she should be holy and without blemish. And this is describing what the work of Christ is doing for his bride, the church. But then notice what he goes on to say. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. In other words, in the same way, husbands ought to be spiritually helping um, sanctify their own brides and washing them in the water of the word. And he says, he who loves his wife loves himself, right? You are to have a spiritual oversight and care for your bride. And then we see in Ephesians 3, 7, that line at the very end, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Well, why would his prayers be hindered by not 
leading his wife the way he's supposed to. Because God called him to be a spiritual overseer of his household. And if he's not doing that, that's going to mess up his own relationship with God. God takes this very seriously when men do not shepherd their wives how they ought. And I just want to ask you men, are you leading your wife and your children spiritually? Or in your household, honestly, is your wife kind of wearing the pants in that regard? Who's the one that's encouraging you guys to, to go to church in the morning? Who's the one that's like, hey, we, we should pray before this meal? Who's the one that's trying to encourage the Bible reading in the household? Who's the one that's taking the ownership of discipleship? Often, men, we just delegate that completely to our wives and, and don't step in at all. Men, God has called us to be shepherds in our household. That's not a duty that God has given us to delegate. Does that mean that our, our wives aren't allowed to do spiritual things? Absolutely not. They're not allowed to pray in our home? Absolutely not. Aren't allowed to help disciple our kids? Absolutely not. But God has placed us to be a spiritual leaders. We can't just delegate that task. We have to take ownership of it and ensure that it's happening. So men, what if that's not the case? What if as you analyze your life, you're like, I'm really not leading my family spiritually? Well, I'd encourage you to start small and build from there. It's easy to get overwhelmed by that calling, and so you do nothing, right? And many of us men, as, as tough as we try to act, when it comes to these matters, often we're full of insecurities. Am I doing this right? Is it awkward? What, like, I don't know everything about the Bible. And so we're just, because of those insecurities, we're kept away from leading our family spiritually. I encourage you to start, start by leading a dinner prayer. If you're not doing that already, pray for with your family before dinner. And don't just do the, God is great, God is good, now we thank you for our food, amen, you know. Like, actually pray. Thank God for the blessings in your life. Pray about the needs of your family. Really thank Him for the good things He's done. Another way you can start small in this, men, is prioritize church. Be the type of husband who's like, rain or snow, we're going to be there, right? You mark it on the calendar. You prioritize it. Your family knows that dad's going to be up early getting the pot of coffee ready, right? Making sure the kids' shoes are on and they're out the door. He prioritizes it. He values it. It's not like we're going to go unless something better comes along. Start with those small things. Another thing you can start by doing to lead your family spiritually is sing loud at church. Many men are known for standing there with their arms crossed and a grumpy face through the entirety of the singing. Does that show a heart that loves the Lord? Is that, and you're, guess what? Your wife and your kids are watching when you're doing that. Your sons are learning from that. Make no mistake. Oh, well, dad doesn't do it. Dad doesn't care. It's not masculine. It's not cool. You think your sons don't pick up on that? Of course they do. Sing loud. Our God is great and greatly to be praised. The men should sing loud in this church. Another way you can start small, leading spiritually, is pay your tithes. Now, I say this not as a preacher trying to like gin up some money, but as men, we take a lot of value in our ability to provide, right? That's, that's part of our nobility in our family. A great way you can lead your family spiritually is say, hey, the first fruits of my labor, I'm giving to the Lord. And your family is going to pick up on that. That's a way of showing your values. That's a way of showing them where your heart is. As well, I encourage you, just take advantage of those spontaneous opportunities. When you can see that your wife or your children is in distress, pray for them. When you see something beautiful, praise God in that moment and express that to them. Be diligent to just take those opportunities that life gives you to be a shepherd, to point to the Lord in things. Man, wasn't today beautiful? Isn't our God great? Right? Like, just take those, you would be amazed what those little moments mean to your family. Because often as men, we can be very formulaic and very rigid. And sometimes it can seem like we're just going through the motions. But when your family sees those spontaneous acts that you're taking to worship the Lord, they'll catch on to that. It's going to add credibility to the faith that you are proclaiming. <clears throat> 
As well, I encourage you as spiritual shepherds in your home to take ownership of the things that are discipling your family. Maybe that's the movies you guys watch, the music you listen to, the books you're reading, the things they're learning. Guys, there's all kinds of things out there vying for our attention, vying for our discipleship. Everything's trying to sell us something. And as men, we got to be discerning over that. I'm not saying we need to go hide in, under a rock. I'm not saying, you know, we all need to go become Amish or something, right? Like, I'm not advocating that. But men, we should take ownership. What are the things that are influencing my family? And be aware of those things. Engage with those things, if nothing else, to help disciple your family through those things. We need to be taking ownership of that. And lastly, I just encourage you, this is maybe, if, 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 I would almost say ignore this if you haven't done some of those earlier things. But if you're really trying to pursue the Lord and you want to grow in this, I'd encourage you to start leading your family in family worship. And in five, eight minutes a day, we, we like to do it right before kids' bedtime, but it can be around the dinner table, it can be around breakfast. Just engage your family in family worship. You know, before the church had women's ministries and men's ministries and youth ministries and children's ministries and all the other ministries that we use for discipleship, the church really focused on one thing to disciple their members, and that was to train the heads of household in order to lead their families in daily family worship in order that the heads of the household could instruct their families in the ways of the Lord. And this looks very simple. It's like praying, reading a passage of scripture, and singing a song. It's not complicated. It doesn't take a theology degree. In fact, you could be a believer for two days and do this. But it's leading that fa your family through worship in your home. It's a wonderful practice. It's one that I pray that the church would restore and revive that used to be commonplace amongst Christians that has really fallen out of favor is men leading their family in family worship. I just encourage us men, the stakes are too high for us to ignore this. According to recent polls, about 70% of young adults stop attending church after 18 years old. That's not a good retention rate. That's a terrible retention rate. 70%. And we're just, a lot of us, passively going along thinking that, I'm sure it'll work out great. And I pray it does for all of us. But we need to be diligent in discipling our families. We can't just assume that someone else is going to do it. We need to own that responsibility as men of God to shepherd our homes. A godly husband is a shepherd. The next point, a godly husband is a leader. Now this is included in a lot of those things about being a shepherd, right? All those things implied leadership. But it's also takes on more than just the spiritual oversight of the family. It's implicit, in, if you think of the whole section we were in last week, with the wives' command to submit, well, they're submitting to what? To a leader, right? If there's a call to submit on one end, then there's a call to be a leader on the other end. It's an implicit command. And this as well is what started in the Garden of Eden. God gave Adam to be the leader and his wife to be the what? The helpmate. That implies that he was the leader in that. And friends, I just need to say, husbands, listen to me. You are the leader of your household. I've, I've heard guys come to me before and say, oh, I, I want to be a leader in a house and I, I want to start doing this. And it's like, no, you are a leader. The question is, are you a good one? Are you a godly one or not? You are a leader. The question is, are you a strong, compassionate, caring, diligent, respectful, serving, honoring, as this text says? Understanding, as this text says, leader? Or are you the type of leader who's derelict, absent, harsh, rude, controlling, overbearing, domineering? You know, our world likes to throw around the phrase like toxic masculinity, right? And in many regards, it's just an assault on all masculinity. And it's quite wicked. Men need to be men, and it's not bad to be a man. But we also know that there's men who abuse their 
authority that God has given them. They're not compassionate. They're not understanding. They are overbearing, right? And we certainly want to reject those things as Christian men. Listen to the type of leader that God is calling us to be in this verse. Husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way. Do you live with your wife in an understanding way? Or is it just your way or the highway? Men, we should be taking counsel from our wives. They're our helpmate. And we can't understand them if you never listen to them. So you should probably talk to them, hear them, inquire of them. Live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman. Do you honor your wife? Or is it all about you? Men, we must be godly leaders in our home. Now, one of the things about being a godly leader is that we always need to take responsibility for the things in our household. Now, this doesn't mean that we're always at fault for everything, but it means that we take responsibility for everything. This is like if you, any of you have been a manager at a job before, or the boss in any sort of thing, right? What's the phrase that often we use? Responsibility flows uphill, right? Or rolls uphill. That's, if you have an employee under you do something wrong, that might not be your fault, right? They might have been trained in what to do. They might have had the equipping not to make that mistake. But if they make that mistake, who's the one who has to answer for it ultimately, right? It's the manager. It's the boss. And you got to take responsibility to help make sure it gets corrected and doesn't happen again, right? Well, it's a similar way in our homes. We need to take responsibility as men for the things going on in our households. Does this mean that everything that happens in our household is always our fault? Like every time our wife or our children sin, it's our fault? No, of course not. We are all equally made in the image of God and we all equally fell at the fall, all right? We are all sinners, husband and wife and children all together. But as men, we take responsibility for the sins of our household and seek to help lead out of them. We take responsibility. So a godly husband is redeemed. He's a shepherd. He's a leader. The next point is a godly husband is a provider. A godly husband is a provider. God made men to work. He made men to work in the Garden of Eden before any sin entered the wor world. God gave Adam a job. You know, Adam's name even means from the dust. And what was his job? To work the ground, all right? His name implies even his job. He was to be a worker, right? He was given the charge to take dominion, to cultivate, right? And we see this in the curses as well. Even after the fall, even after sin entered the world, do you know what happened for Adam? His work continued, but it is about to get hard, right? He was going to have to work with sweat on his brow. Work was going to become difficult. Now, we see this call that we are to be providers in Genesis, but we also see it in 1 Timothy, where it says, but if anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for the members of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. See, men, we are given the call to provide for our families. And this is part, not the only part, but this is part of what's even been spoken of here in verse 7 of the woman being the weaker vessel. God made men even physically to labor. Does that mean there's not strong women out there? Of course it doesn't mean that. But if you look at world records in weightlifting, all right, there's a difference. All right? God made men and women different. Part of our physical makeup, part of that's what's getting at there with the weaker vessel. It's just the bodies God has given us. He made men to work. There's a reason we can lift more. That's not an accident. Now, is that to say there's women who can't outlift me? Of course, that's, that's not true. There are women that can do that. All right? There's some crazy strong women out there. But as a whole... Men are stronger women, and God didn't just do that accidentally, all right? He created our frames for our purpose. And so, men, we ought to be strong workers and providers. A godly husband should be a provider. I just want to ask you, men, are you diligent in your labors? Do you work hard as unto the Lord? It's not going to be easy. The curses told us that. 
We know that our labors here on this earth will be hard, but are you working hard unto the Lord? Are you seeking to be a good provider? Are you the type of guy that always makes excuses for why you can't get ahead? Is it always someone else's fault? Are you taking ownership? God made us men to be workers. And we can overdo that. We can become workaholics, certainly. But within a healthy system, we should embrace that calling that God has given us to be providers for our household. And not even just now for our temporary needs, but men, we should be thinking about generations to come as well. Proverbs 13.22 says, A good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children, but the sinner's wealth is laid up for the righteous. So I encourage you, think about how can I use the fruit of my labors to bless my family? Not only even my immediate family, but my generations to come. God thinks generationally, and we should as well as men seeking to provide. Young men, start building this muscle early. Let's train our boys to be strong workers. And young ladies, I encourage you to look for that quality in a man. Is he the type of man who will take on that burden of responsibility to lead me in marriage? Now, I don't think this means by modern American standards that we need to provide, you know, an upper middle class lifestyle for our families and we need to be able to provide cable TV and steak dinners every night, right? Sometimes this call to be a provider can get wrapped up with all these luxuries, no. But we are called to provide for the basic needs of our house and we should seek to bless our family in whatever way we can. And so seek to be a good provider for your home. That doesn't make you a prosperity gospel person. That doesn't make you someone who's just trying to, you know, get big yachts and grow your fame. Just be a diligent worker who wants to provide for your family whom God entrusted to you. That's a good thing. And I do want to make a note here about last week. I made a point of, on God's word where it calls women to be workers at the home. And we talked about should women work outside of the home and gave some commentary on that on some things to think about. I just want to make the point here that as men are called to be providers, I've heard many times, a, a shocking amount of times in counseling where women say, I would love to stay home, but my husband just doesn't make enough. Or I would Love to stay home, but my husband wants me to work so that we can give our kids more than we had. I just encourage you, husbands, is that living with your wife in an understanding way, with her desires and her passions? Is that seeking to take on that burden of provision, or is that giving to your wife the thing that God has placed on you? Again, that's not to take away any of the things I said last week about I think there is a good healthy place for women to work outside the home in certain circumstances, but men should be the ones who take that ownership of responsibility. If both spouses work and that's what they decide, that's what they decide, but as men, you should realize that God placed that responsibility on you and take that ownership of leadership. I know that's not popular in 2020 to say, but that's what God's word calls us to. The last point I want to make is that a godly husband is a protector. And that's part of what's getting at here with this idea of the woman being a weaker vessel. Now, often as men, when we see weakness, we want to exploit it. I heard a pastor describing this verse recently where he talked about, for example, if you're, if you're in sports, right, and you know that the opposing team has one weak player, right, what is it that you want to push on? Right? You want to hit them at their weak point. If you're in boxing right, and you know that they have one side that's getting hurt, you want to pound that side. Right? You want to exploit the weakness. But here, as the wife is the weaker ve vessel, rather than exploit it, we are called to honor it. We are called to protect it. I love the illustration of this idea of woman being a weaker vessel. It says the woman is a nice, fine china or a goblet for wine. Whereas the man is more like a thermos, all right? We have different purposes, all right? Just because that goblet of wine might break a little easier if you throw it in the back of your pickup truck doesn't mean it's less valuable or important. In fact, it's worth far more than that thermos will ever be. Are we taking the ownership of protection? As men, are we the ones where when we see danger, we run towards it? <laughs> 
A lot of our men are growing up to be cowards today. I just encourage you, man, we're, we're all different sizes and statures, right? I, none of us in here are Bruce Lee, okay? So some of us might be more or less capable of defending ourselves. I encourage you, take steps forward in that. Whatever that looks like, if that's getting weapons and becoming proficient in them, is that having a plan so you actually think through how to protect your family? Do that. We need more men to take the ownership of protection. That is a good thing. We need our men, especially in our church, to be a type of when there's danger, they run towards it, not away from it. We need to be the type of guy where if we see a problem going on, we're the ones willing to stop our car and intervene and help those in need. We don't want cowardly men in this church. And Revelation 21.8, as it goes through this list of sins, of different sins that lead a person to hell, cowardice is one of them. We need to be very careful that we are not cowards in this church, that we are men of God who are willing to protect. And if you want to step up for this, I know we even have some need to have more people to serve in security here in our church. Men, I encourage you to step up, help with that. That should be something that we help in. And does this mean that a woman can never defend herself? No. But if someone's breaking in the front door, I would sure hope that the husband gets there before the wife, all right? He's not standing behind his wife like, get him, honey, right? No, he's, he's going to battle. And you know, depending on who comes through that front door, they might get through me, but they're gonna have to go over my dead body before they get to my family. That's the type of attitude we need to have as men. We need to be willing to do what we can to defend those that God has given to our care. You see, as men, we are called to be leaders, but it's a humble leadership. It's a service. It's one that gives of itself, not one that just is trying to build up oneself. We are to love our wives as Christ loved the church, but how did Christ love the church? He died for it. He gave himself up. He was sacrificial for his bride's behalf. And we need to be the type of men who is sacrificed on our wives' behalf. I don't know where you're at this morning, men, where you're at in your pursuit of the Lord, but take a step forward. Be a godly man who's willing to lead your home and be a shepherd, be a leader, be a provider, be a protector. But most important, be redeemed by the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Dear Father, I thank you so much for your word. I just pray for the men of this church that you allow us to be godly. You allow us to step into the callings into which you've called us. And you allow us to be faithful for, to those things. And God, I just know for myself, I need your grace. I need your help. And I know the other men in this church do as well. So Lord, would you help us to be humble? Would you help us to repent to our families? Maybe we need to repent of some things to our wives this afternoon. But take steps forward, knowing that there's grace in the gospel and knowing there's perfect forgiveness in the cross. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.